that Sarah Helen searched in vain for hours yesterday for one single image of a black God the Father, and all she could find was porn. Will you pray with me, please? Abba Father, please help us to find our way home. Through all the hate, through all the violence, through all the grief, through all the discrimination, through all the misunderstanding and the ignorance and the pain, God, help us to find our way home, God, where you prepare a banquet table for us, God, where it is your deepest dream that we all sit and feed one another. God, as this is the most desperate prayer of your heart, may it also be the most desperate prayer of ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, this is our third Sunday in our Bad Boys and Girls of the Bible series, and <clears throat> This sermon was supposed to be about the prodigal son, who we all know to be the quintessential bad boy. But then again, events happened Wednesday night, and I changed the sermon so that really the prodigal son, our bad boy, can really just lead us directly to the father in this particular story. I'm assuming probably most of us are familiar with the story of the prodigal son, but if we are, we're probably familiar with the version that says that there was this son who was just so greedy and so spoiled, perhaps, and so selfish that he went to his father and said, Dad, give me my inheritance now. I'm out of here. So he, his father gave, his, gave him his inheritance. He left. He squandered all of his wealth in what is called riotous living. Anyone ever engaged in riotous living? <laughs> I never have. <laughs> and then a famine came in a land where he had run off to and he found himself in great hunger and in great shame and humiliation and really just in misery. He was just miserable. Misery is what drove him back home. And we know the story is he repented and his father welcomed him back and he was able to be rewarded in spite of his sin. Not a bad version of the story. The problem with that story, though, is that it makes this story about what Western Christianity seems to always be about. Do we get rewarded in the end, even if we've been sinful? Do we get to go to heaven? That's why we come to church, isn't it? We hope to get to heaven. We want reassurance about that. And that's okay. We're human, you know. But it makes Western Christianity boil down to just that. What can we get out of God? What can we get if we marry God for money? We make sure we get to heaven. And what happens when we only know that interpretation of the story is that we entirely miss out on what the story is really about. And to know what this story is really truly about, we have to hear it through first century Middle Eastern ears. So I'm going to ask you to find your first century Middle Eastern inner ear. It's in there somewhere. And listen to a different interpretation. Before I go into that, I'll also say this. I left out of the scripture reading the part of the story that goes on that addresses the other son, the good son, who's bitter that the younger son engaged in riotous living comes home and faces no consequences. Because originally this, son, this sermon was just going to be about the bad boy. So I'm going to attack the good boy on there, too. But if you don't see it in your scripture, that's why. So listen for a moment to Jesus telling this story to his listeners. They would not have been concerned in hearing the story about whether or not it's about heaven or hell. Judaism has never been about that. Judaism has always been about being in relationship with God day by day and being in the here and in the now and working with God on something called tikkun olam which means the repair and the mending of the world. That that's why we're here. That's what Judaism is about. And so Jesus told this story to his listeners who had that in their perspective. Not about what the story was going to say about their eternal reward or punishment. 
And what we need to know when Jesus told them this story is that they would have been shocked and appalled beyond anything I can say to hear this description of this father. Because in Jesus' day, the father was the patriarch supreme. Fathers did not get involved in emotional issues with children. They especially would not have gotten involved with something as petty as sibling rivalry. That was the wife's duty. They would never have entertained a request from a son for an inheritance. To ask a father for their inheritance before the father had passed away would have been an insult beyond imagining. They would have probably just been immediately disowned. And not only that, this son threw all, everything out on the front lawn in a yard sale and sold it all to get more money so that the shame of the family could be seen by everyone. Such a thing could not even be comprehended. And then, no father ever goes running after their child for anything in Jesus' day. Aristotle said, great men do not run. This father would never have been running after his son. And then, in the part we didn't hear this morning, the father gets up from a banquet table to run after the other son, the good son, and invite him to come to the table and eat with his returned brother. So this father is running around everywhere trying to get the children to come in. Fathers never, ever did anything like this in that day. They would have been so shocked to hear any of this. And yet this is the picture that Jesus paints of this father. But what might be most shocking of all is, do you notice the little phrase this is in your scripture? It says, while he was still far off. How easy it is to miss in this story that the prodigal son never apologizes before he receives his welcome back from his father. It says that while the prodigal son is still far off, before he has a chance to utter a word of any kind of repentance, whether it's genuine or not, because remember, he's hungry. Hunger can make you do a lot of things, whether they're genuine or not. Before he ever gets a chance to say anything like that to his father, his father is already running to welcome him back home. This is not a story about a God who gives out eternal reward or punishment based on our behavior or repentance. This is a story, what I call the desperately determined father, who will do anything, suffer any shame, go through any indignity, stand in the face of any societal norm, and destroy all of that for the sake of getting all of his children together at the table. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. yep. This is what being a follower of Jesus is about. And this is why he was telling this story to his listeners. It wasn't about, oh, repent and you can be rewarded. No, it was said, Jesus was saying, look, this is God. This is God, Abba, Father, Daddy, begging begging, begging, running, running, desperately running after his children, begging, 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 begging them to please sit down at the table and get along. That's what this story is about. Can you hear Abba, Father, begging today? What do we say in light of what happened on Wednesday night? What do we say when our country is so numb to the horror of what happened Wednesday night? Why isn't every leader we have in the streets screaming for things to be different? Mm -hmm. On Thursday morning, I called every AME church in the area and offered our support. And there was one where I got a hold of a human being. Payne Chapel downtown. It's one of the oldest churches in West Palm Beach. 
There are eight congregations within walking distance of each other, seven Christian and one synagogue, all within walking distance of each other downtown. All but perhaps one of them, besides Payne Chapel, are predominantly white. And Thursday night, Payne Chapel had a prayer service. And Reverend Marion and my wife, Sarah Helen, were the only two white people there. Eight congregations in walking distance of each other. Why wasn't every person of every congregation downtown with them? In retrospect, I am very glad that we had the prayer service we had here. Very, very glad. Very grateful to have experienced that. But in retrospect, I wish I would have said, we're all going to go worship with them. Someone walked into Mother Emmanuel and said, you are raping our women and you are taking over our country and you have to go. How easy would it be for us to suffer someone coming in this sanctuary saying, you are molesting our children, you are taking over our country with gay marriage, and you have to go. My friends, we have got to get the connections between our oppressions. And always there are going to be forces who are trying to drive a wedge between the gay community and the black community, and we cannot let that happen. God the Father, God the Mother, God the Eternal is begging us to remember that there is only one thing that is most important and that is relationship. Forget heaven. Forget hell. Instead, look at who is next to you and see if you can stand them or not. And whether or not you can, can you still treat them with love? How many gay people in this congregation have said, disparaging things about Haitians? How many Haitians have said disparaging things about gay people? How many people in this congregation have said things full of misunderstanding about people living with HIV? How many gay men living with HIV just don't get women? Why they have to be such? Our faith is about nothing if it is not about the one thing that is most important to the heart of God, and that is relationship. And the only way we can live out relationship is one day at a time, one prejudice at a time, getting through it, one misunderstanding at a time, one choice of standing in solidarity with each other at a time. That's it. So I want to do two things today. One is I want to say, to every person with dark skin in this congregation, I am so sorry. As a white person, I am so, so sorry. And I am not wallowing in guilt. Guilt is useless, and it's a waste of time. But I am sorry that we live in a world where a white man would go into a black church and kill nine people. Fathers and mothers and 87-year-old women people who did nothing in their lives but add love to this world, I am so sorry that that happened for no other reason than the thing. And to this congregation, I will say this. I want us to build a relationship with Payne Chapel. Mm -hmm. Their pastor's name is Reverend Green, mm -hmm. and my name is Reverend Brown. It's already a <laughs> I want us to build a relationship with that church. Reverend Marion spoke, they, they, she walked through the door, they didn't know her from Eve. <laughs> and they invited her freely up on the podium with seven other black ministers to speak. You may have seen her on the news. And the pastor said to Sarah Helen, have your pastor call me, I want us to do something. So we're going to do that because we can't take on white supremacy all in one chunk. But we can get to know our neighbors in our lives, in our community, and stand together. And if we all do that, something has got to change. And I'm going to hold in my heart, and I invite you to hold it with me too, that even when the prodigal son was still a long way off, way off the target, God was still there, saying, come, let us dine together.